everybody and welcome to our 10th episode of Aimless Ramblings. Today we're going to be discussing a little bit about creativity and how it can sort of hold a therapeutic uh, relationship with our lives. Now, I think to start off, we're going to throw to Sam, who's going to address this from uh, a broad sort of spectrum, and then we'll sort of go and narrow it down a little bit more as we go along. So, throwing to you, Sam. G'day all. Um, fortunately, we're recording this in the morning because there's going to be an awful lot of waffle in this. So, bear with us, everyone. Um, in brief, I'm going to talk about why we make stuff. You know, why we have the desire to create. The answer is, by the way, I have no idea and no one does. So we'll cut to the chase there. But, you know, it's a broad discussion about um, the topic. Of um, in this case, creation is probably like making things beyond their pure um, function. So, you know, anything that has any aesthetical aspects is, in this context, the creation. So, like, um, deciding what color you're going to make your tractor or your... Um, brand new combine harvester is the aesthetic choice you know um the tractor or the combine harvester itself is the functional device that humans create but you know even a goddamn tractor factors into aesthetics um everyone creates based on aesthetics um you know even if you're not someone who actively pursues it as a hobby you know if you're um doodling while you're on a hold to the call center or something, you know, that is um, creating. You know, it's um, this visual creation from the static in your mind or something. You know, drawing glasses on people in magazines or um, humming to yourself. It's all just this creation we make. Um, and it's something that everyone does, you know, like from the steppes of Mongolia um, to the Arctic Circle, they all have incredibly intricate and decorated clothing. You know, it's beyond the functional, it's the aesthetic it ties in with our clothing conversation last week, actually. Um, and it's interesting because it's universal, right? So everyone does it. So it's up there with food and sex as things that are just a universal or pivotal aspect of the human experience. But it's interesting because most of these universal or pivotal experiences or activities have at their heart a... Um, function of survivability either for the individual or the species you know like sex is procreation pass on genetic material food is energy you know and yeah like the Kama Sutra is um, not just based on procreation you know you can have flavor to it as such but we do create things that have no direct survivability function um, you know like a pointy stick stabs just as well with or without some pretty carvings on it, but we still, you know, choose to add pretty carvings to our pointy sticks. And um, it's interesting, too, that we dedicate a lot of time and energy to it, even when there's a... Um, when you're in an environment where calories are incredibly important as such, you know. Um, a beautiful example of this is a fella called Bronze Law Jack. He was an um, alpine skier and Olympian, multiple times gold medalist. And he made um, quite a few lovely, intricate wooden caskets. They were, you know, probably about 20 centimeters each. And this was done in the years leading up to his death, whilst in Auschwitz. Now, this is a man that is in a concentration camp, in the process of dying in a concentration camp of starvation. And he still has the time or energy to make some art. Uh, Simon? Yeah, yeah. Um, very interesting how you brought up the whole entire concept of how it's like a – there's no actual functional reasoning for the creativity as you discussed. Um, the only thing that I can think of is like is it almost like a dry run for like societal memes? So it's easier to do a creativity on something that has low risk, low reward instead of doing it on something that has a high risk. And as such, creativity is just a byproduct of us having to practice making memes for society. I take it you mean memes in the um, concept of passed on social ideas rather than um, internet pictures, yeah? That is correct, yes. 
Ah, okay, that makes far more sense. I was like, oh, geez, what? Um, but then I forgot it actually has a real meaning. Um, yeah, and it's entirely possible it is something like that. Like, um, I was wondering if it could be maybe a byproduct of having an intelligent mind, you know, like we are, um, in theory, as a human beyond the base, base needs of our animals, whatever. Is this an activity just to fill the gaps, uh, Tim? So one thing I have read about is something called uh, bioaesthetics, and it talks about how potentially aesthetics and our attraction to beauty has more to do with uh, primitive drivers towards attractions, uh, towards symmetry, uh, which indicate potentially a better a better likelihood of being a good mate, like we're uh, attracted to certain proportions of bodily figure because they generally indicate certain proportions of body mass which are suitable for uh, reproduction. Uh, people have also argued even music. Uh, in some ways, the rhythm of music may be something like the rhythm of a heartbeat. Being close and intimate to somebody means feeling their heartbeat and such. Uh, music has that kind of effect on us. Uh, I mean, some of these analogies may be a bit of a, a long bow to draw, but uh, I know we have talked previously about consciousness and phenomena as kind of just being emergent properties that exist not because of any particular reason but because things earlier down the track have just caused them to to come into existence do you think this is a a reasonable explanation maybe maybe beauty and creation are just kind of an inevitable but accidental consequence of our own reproductive desires um it's entirely possible that that's where they come from, but so to go back to, um, gosh, I've forgotten his name. It's a bit rude of me. Um, Bronislaw, and I'm probably butchering that name, everyone. It's Polish. So, you know, I come from the con country where we say Kosciuszko instead of Kuszkuszko. So forgive me. Um, whether or not they have come as a byproduct of these um, evolutionary selectors, it doesn't actually, I, th I don't think, is relevant. Because so uh, you've got this guy in a concentration camp producing art that's actually, you know, forbidden. He's not allowed to produce art and he's in the process of dying. He's wasting precious calories to do it. So I don't think whether or not the things that he finds pretty, you know, like you were more talking about the reasoning behind why we find things aesthetically pleasing, not the um, drive to create. So like... Um, you know, most animals find symmetry attractive. You know, if you look at the patterns on a butterfly or on a bird, the sexual, um, the display, right? Foliage on a bird, often incredibly symmetrical because symmetry is a sign of health, you know, it's proper development, all this. So the bird still finds this attractive, but the bird doesn't compose paintings despite finding symmetry attractive. So I agree, most likely our tastes have been influenced by these drivers, but not necessarily the desire to create. What do you reckon, Tim? Yeah, like I definitely, it's one of the first arguments I suppose is made is the uh, the argument of the fallacy of nature or the fallacy from biology, which is just because something is natural doesn't necessarily mean that naturalism can completely explain it or make it right. And I suppose uh, a great example of a theorist has taken creativity very seriously is Maslow with uh, the hierarchy of needs. And I'm sure Simon is very happy to jump on this in a second, but uh, human actualization and creativity is sort of seen as that last step in terms of a need. Uh, and maybe if we're talking about humans here as a process, like this creativity is that is that step of actualization that turns us into a human uh although once again the the line between humanity and uh the rest of the animal kingdom is is pretty blurry simon yeah i'm just here to talk about maslow's hierarchy of needs uh the first paper it was published in was a cosmo <laughs> magazine where it was discussing like you know what should women focus on so uh yeah it's in the psych community it's sort of seen as a bit of a faux pas but obviously yeah later on it was you know discussed to further lengths but yeah it's pretty regularly just chucked in with like the same as the what's the scale with the four letters yeah that's that was created by two um housewives that just wanted to make something to make themselves feel special but yeah 
That is absolutely brilliant and possibly the greatest thing I've ever learnt in this entire podcast history. Thank you, Simon. Um, something I was reading, it's a... Um, oh, gosh, I've closed the tab. Uh, book by a lady, essentially. Ellen, a name that's really long and hard to pronounce. Um, and she talks about... It's called um, Homo Aestheticus. And it does talk a large part about how we seem to be the only animal that creates art. And um, even early things like um, Homo erectus, they're not really sure whether or not they actually even made art. So but some there's very few things. There's somewhere there's a couple of geometrical patterns on shells, but they, you know, it's stretching it to go beyond what could have happened incidentally to call it art or the creative desire. So, you know, it could just be so far a human trait. I mean, it doesn't make it, you know, anything inherently special. It could just be we're the only ones with the hardware with the desire to do it. Um, my closing point, just to wrap my little part up, I guess, is um, I wonder if it just gives a little bit of meaning to an otherwise um, pointless, you know, life. You know, like routine life is a bit dull sometimes. Creating gives you um, a break. All right, what do you reckon, Tim? Well, I think that that is a pretty poignant note to end on with regards to your part, but I was going to throw to Simon actually uh, because he's going to take us in a completely different direction. I suppose focusing more so, well, what you've just kind of discussed there at the end, the therapeutic aspect of creation. How can creation sort of uh, help us live through our lives or through the pain of our lives depending on your Schopenhauerian pessimistic tendencies? So, Simon? Thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, I, I better cover this before I go any further. Yes, technically, sociologically, Maslow's hierarchy of needs existed before the Cosmo article, but as a psychological concept, it was first mentioned in Cosmo. So, yeah, just wanted to get that out of the way. Um, now, to follow up, uh, I'm specifically discussing the uh, rising uh, like uh, flavor of enjoyments of Dungeons and Dragons as a concept. Um, and, you know, a lot of people who weren't through that period of time where it was first, first edition and so forth have discussed how it really helped them through dark times and whatnot. And that was like an informal way of saying, you know, they made friends and whatnot. But there's actually a group of psychologists who are actually using it in like therapeutic ways to deal with trauma and also therapeutic ways to gain social skills in a low risk area because... When you're playing D&D, it doesn't really matter if you fail a social encounter. You can just keep on, you know, going on with the quest. You know, you can smack him in the head with an axe or do whatever you need to do. It's just one of the potential ways. But it's a really interesting way for people to deal with their traumas because, as I think uh, Sam discussed previously in the last episode, uh, we as humans can't differentiate between what we create as a concept and what actually happens to us. So they are in the, processed in the same part of the brain, so it actually helps with healing without having to put people through trauma. Um, so I'll, I've actually got two references for this. Uh, first of all, there's a lovely TED Talk by a... I can't even know what he studies, but he discusses like the major areas in which it benefits. And then uh, there's a PhD a psychologist in America who's actually using it. She is an ex-veteran and she uses it both for young children in the respect for socialization, but also in veterans to help them get that camaraderie, but also to like work through the traumas which, which they've experienced through war. Um, anyway, that's pretty much my element of how creativity, the creative role-playing game D&D has actually been used like quite effectively in uh, helping people move past used to have in the past. Uh, Sam, you have something you want to say? Uh, yeah, I'm wondering if you've got any um, more in-depth in how they're um, using it to treat the PTSD sort of thing. It's like, um, are they role-playing like, through d and I guess, the exact encounter that has caused it or something like that? Or just, you know, I just don't... I'm just curious, I guess, how they actually are going about helping uh, excuse me for a second. I'm just going to pull up the page and actually read the session that she has rather than trying to paraphrase it. But for D&D &D therapy, 
in relation specifically with the veterans. Uh, hang on to your identity as a soldier can be difficult. Often battles leave scars. That cannot be easily a thing. The veteran D&D group is game and form of things. The game will focus on the building identity outside of being an adventurer while uh, getting to play homage to the skills and abilities that one has spent years honing. So it's more of that transition into civilian life by the looks of things. So you were certainly a warrior in the past, but now you've also got to move into you know the present as a person that used to be in war. So I think that's the major focus that the D&D campaign has. So it's like that particular one for veterans is what they've had. Um, obviously, it gets more specific with particular groups, but yeah. For example, they've got the social skills one, so people who've lost that. Then there's also one for low sensory opening, so that's people who have sort of started to shut down from having uh, interactions with others because, you know, the horrors have got too great. Uh, I hope that covers it. Um, but, Tim, you want to have something to say? Yeah, I suppose it's an interesting one talking about creativity and creation and. You, you talked there about uh, from a veteran's perspective, people that once held an identity marker, in this case being a soldier, which in some ways either voluntarily, voluntarily or involuntarily, uh, you know, non-consensually has been stripped from them because of discharge and how creativity allows us to play out that identity marker, which then sort of can act as a buffer to get them back into society. It's, it, I suppose it's an interesting one close to home for me because I know that um, suicide rates for members of the military whilst they're in service is actually lower than the general population, but markedly increases after people leave the services. And a, a big part of that, I suppose, has to do with the fact that they, they no longer have that support mechanism both of the the friends that they went through with but also the identity construct which they've built themselves around and i suppose this bring it back to the aesthetics more generally and and uh creativity uh do you think simon that maybe creation is a mechanism by which we as humans can live out roles or identities that are other way otherwise not open to us and maybe that's the the, the effect of aesthetics. It's almost like a, a mechanism, like a like a release valve for uh, identity pressure within the individual. Actually, that's really interesting. I feel like I need to pull up another YouTube video, you know, because I'm an academic. I have so many YouTube videos that are, you know, so reputable. Anyway, so yeah, they were discussing with the DD community and it's weird how this is perfect fit between the LGBTQ community and D&D in the respect that they can live out their lives and their truths so there's a lot of cases where people who have you know been questioning their sexuality and whatnot actually play out their character as that sexuality before they actually identify themselves as that so it's this weird thing where they can as i've already previously stated use a safe space in a way to explore their own emotional sexual you know any of those elements within themselves without having to deal with the repercussions of society at the same time. Uh, anyway, Tim, you had... Yeah, I was just going to say that's concerning for me because I've played evil characters before. So, <laughs> you know, it's a, a little concerning. Am I role-playing some sort of deep suppressed uh, element of my own personality, which is uh, evil and, and unconsciously sort of exploring that? Or is it more just the shock value or... Or uh, you know the the fun of playing out something that would never be me in a, in any other social context, Sam. Uh, I think the point Tim was that here they're role playing things that they aren't in normal society, whereas you're just being yourself. Ha ha. Ha 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 ha. Yes, uh, but definitely I, I think um, Simon throwing back to you. Uh, it, it's an interesting thing. So in terms of – we're talking here purely like games, I suppose. Uh, well, and by games, I mean that like a setting where there is a, a social situation where everyone understands it's a safe space and there is a set of rules and arbitrations which allow us to act in certain ways that would otherwise not be, not be acceptable. But, well, or at least would not be perceived as acceptable by that person or by the people within that group outside of that context. Uh, I, I was wondering, though, in terms of uh, other forms of creation, like, uh, you know, be that like blacksmithing or painting or whatever, do you think that these can also be mechanisms by which people explore their own inner mentality and their own trauma? 
Okay, so now, now, now we're going a bit macro for me. Okay, so you're saying creativity in general is used as like a therapeutic way to move past things. Uh, there's, yeah, there has been a lot of research, especially with music therapy, with mental health and uh, a lot of other areas. So like overall, there is, you know, things, but I haven't got the specific studies on me. But uh, Sam, you have something you want to say? Yeah, um, it just, when you were talking about metalworking then, Tim, it just jumped out. I, mean, I remember, I think it was... Uh, 20, the 2017 bushfires, the Black Wednesday or some such. Um, I apologize to anyone from Victoria. I don't quite recall. But um, one town in particular that was incredibly heavily hit, um, they were, as together as a community, came together and smithed um, leaves to like to make a um, essentially a, a tree statue with the names of their lost, lost ones on it. And a lot of people found that incredibly cathartic to be making, like to be personally making this long-lasting memorial to their lost ones. And I mean, it's blacksmithing because the leaves when they were done were black. And, you know, so it represented the trauma through the fire and at the same time, you know, created this nice piece of art for um, remembrance. Just thought it was interesting. Yeah, and I think uh, that's aesthetically pleasing to me like it's a, it's a beautiful sort of representation of uh, their own trauma and the remembrance and it sort of links well into the next part of this little podcast that we're doing which is where I was going to not really talk about anything profound but my own sort of experience of creation which I've gone through with not only this podcast series which has been great but also the the video series that I've now been doing for god nearly two years now it's kept a little bit scary um, I think that you, you, you hit on uh, the nail on the head there when you said catharsis, like in the Aristotelian sense, like uh, that creation does provide an outlet, at least for me, uh, and I know for other people it does as well, uh, an outlet for emotion in that you can – you feel satisfaction in the object that you're creating. And it like almost, I don't know if it's some sort of serotonin dump or something, but after you've created something, you feel like you've made progress. Uh, and this doesn't matter, but like it doesn't matter about how applicable it is. It doesn't matter about how many people go and watch the video. It doesn't matter even if anyone sees the video. It's more, I suppose, an internalized understanding that you have done something and for me, like I came to the blogging and the video making in 20, end of 2016, start of 2017, sometime in that period there. So what had happened is I'd, I'd sort of gone through a year of language study. And for me, uh, up until that point, one of the big things I'd always wanted to do was want to learn a language because I thought that, hey, smart people should be able to speak more than one language. Therefore, I should want, I want to speak another language that I could be a smart person to. And then after learning a language, I realized that just because you know another language doesn't mean you're smart. It just means you know another language. It's just another skill set. And that sort of set up an existential crisis in myself where I was like, hey, I've got to do something else because at the moment it's it's not really it, my job. And my life sort of felt at that point like I reached sort of a, a cul-de-sac. And so for me, I think creation cr provides – for everybody who everybody creates in some regards but for people that actively pursue creation and in particular like in a in a manner which they can sort of self assess and see improvement in their own products that they create but also uh just like setting up a map of things that they want to do and produce uh like they can they can start their own sort of chain of progress in their mind so that they feel like they're not just treading water or retrograding, they're actually pursuing towards some goal. Even if that goal is completely unattainable uh, and irrelevant uh, to their day-to-day -day life, it, it sort of creates like a framework uh, for them to work within. Simon, you got something to say? Yeah, yeah. As you were discussing, it's really interesting just uh, getting a little glimpse into the you know machinations of Tim, uh, seeing uh, uh, you're not an entirely private human being, but you know you're not particularly very open about discussing your own uh, trials and tribulations. But yeah, it was really interesting seeing how there's this perfect mapping of how you were discussing, like, I, I sort of lost, you know, focus with, you know, thing. I learned a language and my identity was I was smart. So I had, I learned this language because that was what, as a smart person, you do. And with that gap you had, which was I, 
you know, I've learned, I've just learned another language. You realize that learning was the main focus. That was the reason why you started the tra train into wanting to learn. It was the same reason why you started a lot of things and wanted to learn a lot of things and how you sort of get this like endless thing of creating these things. You've not only learned, you know, philosophical stuff, which is what your main focus was, but you've learned a lot in the relations to how to video edit, how to, you know, create a decent length thing, how not to like go step over the bounds, what actually your viewers would want. And I feel like that's a lot of learning in so few years from like 2016 to 2020. It's this almost, you can see the change in your like, how you look at a lot of the world in that respect. Um, I feel like I'm just going to tirade, but yeah, I'm just, I just found it really interesting and how it also has that almost the same thing of how we were referring back to um, when I was talking about the D and D therapy, how it's like they create an alternate identity to try on. And if that is, then they, you know, absorb it. If it's against what they think, they just sort of can just like leave it as that character. It's just that interesting element of how you uh, uh, pursue learning. Anyway, um, does anyone else want to speak? I, I feel like I'm just sort of rambling on, but yeah, back to Tim. Cheers, Simon. Well, I know Sam is someone who also likes to create. Would you like to talk a little bit about maybe, I know that you like cooking, Sam, you like curing meats and then occasionally a little bit of blacksmithing. Have you found those to be sort of useful in your life beyond their practical means? I would say um, definitely useful beyond practical, like especially most of the smithing stuff. Um, you know, I've made quite a bit of jewellery, quite a bit of utensils and the like. Um, and most of it, once I've finished with it, I just melt it back down again. Because, I mean, if I need a knife, I can go to Bunnings and buy a knife. You know, if I want jewellery, I can go and buy jewellery that's been made better than anything I can personally make. But it's um, the action of doing is quite enjoyable. Yeah, that's just something I enjoy. And I mean, fuck, I like bacon. Bacon tastes good. And I think that's just one of the, you know, the empirical um, facts of life. Bacon is tasty. That's about all I got on that. Yeah, I, I was just going to throw in the whole better crocker thing where it's like, you know, that whole entire idea of creation in some ways is better than the cooking. Hence why they added the egg because people didn't feel like they, they felt like they were making a facsimile. But, like, once they added the egg, they felt like they actually baked the cake. But anyway, that was all I was going to say. Yeah, I suppose that's a, it's, a, it's an interesting one. Like, it's more involvement and, and a feeling of authentic involvement within the creative process than the, the product itself that matters. And I suppose that's, um, that's true for these videos and, and uh, podcasts and Sam's Knives. Well, I think we've kind of reached a natural termination point in the video. So uh, thank you very much, everyone, for tuning in, and I hope to hear from you all next time. This great warrior has left to his martyr lord.